Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the betrayal of Asian women in the United States, the history of that betrayal, and how that betrayal has had long-lasting effects, both culturally and legally, for Asians, Asian women in particular, and for society as a whole. My guest for this conversation is Celine Padreñas Shemisu, professor and director of the School of Cinema at San Francisco State University. Her work focuses on race and sexuality in global popular culture. In 2007, she published the book, The Hypersexuality of Race, and last year she released the book, The Proximity of Other Skins. She joins us via Zoom, Celine Padreñas Shemizu. It is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thank you, Mitch. What what does it mean? And I think most people probably have a sense of this, but as as somebody who works on this issue specifically, what does it mean when we say the when we talk about the sexualization of of any race? And of course, we'll we'll obviously talk about specifically for for Asians. Specifically for Asian American women, the sexualization of race can be captured in how they were historically constructed in the law, as well as in their very experiences of entry into the United States. In recent days, because of the violence in Atlanta, for the first time, many are, many people are hearing about the 1875 Page Act, which really barred the entry of Chinese women to the United States as organized around the particular idea of um, the possibility of there being prostitutes. Um, And what that really meant was they were going to bring in a different kind of morality, um, a different kind of uh, sexual option, um, the threat of um, different sexual culture And this created a lot of anxiety because there was a large influx of Asian Americans. And, you know, Asian Americans primarily, you know, the earliest immigrants were bachelor societies. And the whole goal was to bring in cheap labor rather than the opportunity to establish families to change, you know, the racial demographic of the United States. And so the barring of Asian women was related to both the fears of uh, changing demographic of what the racial national identity of Americans would be. But then also this was really tied to a sexualization that meant, you know, were they going to offer a kind of new delight and that would threaten, you know, um, what the family, what the American family would look like. And at the same time, this sexualization is really experienced as a kind of force within representation. So mass culture in the late 19th century really witnessed, you know, these kind of operatic constructions, very dramatic renderings of Asian women as excessively sexualized beings. You know, just really once again, offering a kind of overwhelming threat to Western men about a different kind of sexuality. So it's an overwhelming sexuality, one that didn't seem to recognize what was an appropriate dosage of, of love, desire, you know, sex, because, you know, in, in plays like um, Madame uh, Butterfly in 1904 and Madame Chrysanthemum, Asian women, you know, were devoted to the white male lover in a way that wasn't really reciprocated and it went overboard. Um, It didn't recognize that maybe the guy wasn't all that into her, but she invested, you know, so much that she ended up, you know, killing herself to prove her love, giving up her child to prove her love. I mean, I mean, that's going over the cliff, but what is our attachment to that construction of the overwhelmingly, excessively devoted, you know, strange, almost perverted kind of sexual person, you know, because it gets repeated over time in various uh, representations all the way to Miss Saigon in our present, you know, one of the most lucrative, you know, productions that witnessed this very same um, 
woman. So in a sense, the way I would define the sexualization of race is that, you know, Asian American women are a kind of placeholder of ideologies of sexuality and uh, racialization that really had a lot of meaning in terms of who was going to become, you know, a viable, you know, wife, a viable, you know, female citizen, you know, in this country. And we cannot um, understand the sexualization of Asian American women without really thinking about how they were constructed against the white woman as, you know, a more innocent sexual being who needed to be protected. Because, you know, in a play, in an opera play like Madame Butterfly and Miss Saigon, her perverse and excessive sexuality was really countered to the white woman's normal sexuality. So there's a comparative dimension that we cannot ignore. To, that's interesting to, to, to the white woman, as, as you talk about. And, and we see this beginning in early 20th century with, with, on, on the theater. Um, is, it was, was, it, was it Madame, Madame Butterfly that really begins this, or, or is it more complicated than that? Or both? It's hard to say, you know, when this construction of a different, othered, more perverse kind of sexuality that's been attributed to Asian women began. But, you know, the colonial encounter between Asia and the West really produced, you know, the circulation of images, you know, and there's no shortage of them. It, it didn't just happen in, in theater it also extended to film, right? So Anime Wong was the first um, Asian American, really major Hollywood figure. And one of her first films was a 1920 film called um, Toll of the Sea, the first Technicolor film, you know, amazing achievement in terms of an aesthetic, you know, development in cinema. And at the same time, it was really a repetition of, the Asian woman is this repository of a strange kind of sexuality, you know, that was very intriguing and entertaining for um, the white male lover, but then became so excessive and so scary that he ended up, you know, going back to the U.S. and essentially forgetting about her while she remained so entirely devoted to him. He comes back, you know, to, to China with his white wife, and um, she then finally sees that he has forgotten about her. He does not regard her in the same way that she has completely elevated him, you know, in her life, in her life's meaning. And she ends up, you know, um, drowning herself, killing herself, giving up her, her child and, and giving it to the white American couple, you know, who, who takes off um, with this child. So it's, it's hard to say, you know, when it started. I'm, I'm, I think that there's so much more work to be done in terms of digging up you know, um, this relationship that's been represented on screen. Um, I think it, it's so gendered in the sense that the woman is really rendered in sexual service of, of white men. And it's a kind of sexual service that is a sacrifice of her own self. So it's a sexual being for others in a way that exposes how, you know, the white male lover doesn't really regard her pleasure, her experience, but really sees her as an object for himself. And um, it keeps going. I mean, this repetition keeps going. So that what I assert in my book is that to be an Asian American woman is to have to contend with this huge inheritance of images that define your sexuality not in your own terms, but, you know, really in terms of serving other, serving men. It, it's there. And you and, and other Asian women are facing this on a daily basis. Definitely. I, I began my book, you know, with this scene when I was 17 years old, riding the 51 bus and, um, now that's that's here in the Bay Area. You, yeah, you're going right, to UC yeah, Berkeley. Right, right we we all know the 51. Yeah. Yeah, the 51 bus goes from Alameda to Oakland to the Berkeley campus. And so I was a 17-year-old, you know, Berkeley first-year student. 
And an old man, an older man came up to me while I was in the back of the bus and told and asked me if he had seen me before. Wasn't I a, a prostitute, you know, in Angeles or Olongapo in the Philippines next to the American military bases? And he actually said this out loud in front of people. Didn't I throw ping pong balls out of my vagina? And I remember, I mean, just being so shocked. And but what really struck me in my mind at that time, Mitch, was I am not that woman. Yeah. You know, there was this conflation that I resisted that frightened me because I immediately wanted to go to the side of good womanhood, the kind of womanhood that has been attributed to white women, and instead refused the notion that I could be that person. So there was this conflation of, you know, a Filipino woman from the Philippines, a Filipino woman in the United States, we were the same, but but clearly we weren't the same. In my mind, I was thinking I'm, you know, a 17 year old, upwardly mobile young woman in a research one public university. I am not that woman. And um, that was scary to me because these women are closer to me than white women in a sense, because we're being collapsed, conflated, our identities are colliding. And it was really important to me not to disavow um, sex workers, not not to disavow women who are considered bad in our society because of the structures that forced them to be in low wage work, you know, not having particular choices that I had. So the book really became about really exploring what it meant to be living under a definition of sexuality for Asian American women that should not lead to disavowing not only how sexuality is a force of discipline, um, but also can be a source of pleasure. And Asian American women should not be deprived of our own, you know, sexual awakening, our own uh, pleasure. Sexuality is a source of of life, and and so the book really interrogated, you know, the earliest representations of this sexual imposition of character and identity and and practice, this assertion that Asian American women or Asian women can offer, you know, heterosexual men or or men, you know, different kinds of sexual experiences that you don't get from other women. And, And I wanted to trace that you know, to work as an historian of representations. And so I went from uh, theater to to the earliest films, you know, this construction of the hyper heterosexual um, Asian American femme fatale in Hollywood. And then I couldn't but go, you know, to the site of pornography because pornography promises to go where Hollywood doesn't go. And I wanted to see, well, what are the sex acts that are being attributed to Asian American women and how is the language of film being used to provide kind of visible evidence of that to see is to know and 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 how film provides that you know kind of visual facticity of this you know um fantasy this claim that Asian American women uh provide excessive sexuality um perverse sexuality, proclivity for for sexuality, perpetual availability. What is that looking like in in pornography? And then also closing with how Asian American women themselves are refusing to live under this polar binary of good womanhood and bad womanhood, and instead are using the medium of film to explore the vast expanse of the middle, you know, and really defining their own sexual desires, their own sexual practices, their own sexual identities. The history of the betrayal of, of Asian women, do, do you also, is this, do you think, and I, I think today, it's, it's, everything's so globalized and intermingled, I, I'm, I'm positive we find it everywhere today, but the history, you know, if you, if you look at the early 20th century, is, is this an American thing, or do you also see it happening in European countries, especially European colonial powers that were involved with colonial projects throughout Asia? The representation of Asian women as hypersexual beings, you know, the repository of excessive sexuality, you know, the idea that they are not only contaminating in terms of creating desire, fascinating, mesmerizing, different, but then also this strange idea, historical idea that Asians are also contagious 
in terms of disease really come together in terms of the sexual you know, intrigue towards Asian women that not only come from the United States, but are also present in you know, cultural productions you know, in, in Europe. Right, so um, Madame uh, Butterfly, you know, comes from Europe, you know, uh, Puccini, um, the good woman of uh, Szechuan, Sech- um, Madame Chrysanthemum, they are, you know, European productions that circulated, you know, transnationally and found, found themselves on the stages of um, the US. So it's definitely a transnational formulation. However, Mitch, your question, you know, makes me really think of, you know, um, wars with with Asia and the West, you know, so the Korean War, you know, the Vietnam War, and how they produced not only particular kinds of laws, but the representation of Asian women as prostitutes, you know, so this was really um, organized in terms of military presence in Asia, you know, the construction of rest and recreation or rest and relaxation for the military. This was, you know, by no means accidental, but it was cultivated by this relationship between two nations, right? And, um, you know, the the women who worked as sex workers, you know, had to get, you know, testing. And this was not organized just by the by the women themselves. It was really organized, you know, structurally um, between the military and the, the, the resident nation, you know. And so it's interesting to think about, you know, the rampant images of the Asian woman as a prostitute. So if you're an Asian American actor and you look at your Met resume or the opportunities for casting you, much like, you know, how many times do Asian American male actors have to write unspeaking, you know, Chinese delivery waiter, you know, on their, on their resume, the availability of roles as prostitutes slash um, uh, sex workers are, are, you know, are available for Asian American women. And it's interesting to think about representations like The World of Susie Wong, a box office hit in 1960, you know, just a, a gorgeous film, you know, portray- the, the, the sex worker, um, Nancy Kwan, you know, portrayed this role with her dancer's body and her dancer's movement and a very elegant countenance. And it was a huge hit. However, you know, it, it, people attribute that film as the birth of this representation of the Asian woman prostitute and extended that to, you know, the movement from the availability of prostitutions through the military experience towards a more commercial sex industry. And really this equation of Hollywood uh, films that led to the sex tourism industry, you know, where Asian American feminists have called it, you know, the treatment of Southeast Asian countries, et cetera, as a kind of brothel for the West. Um, And so, that's that's what I think of when you when you ask me about the transnational circulation of these images, but then there's also this transnational, you know, um, traffic and bodies, you know, that are happening where Western men, you know, from Europe and the U.S., you know, go to Asia and participate in the sex industry, you know, and, and come back. And sometimes, you know, there's also this um, movement of brides, you know, war brides or or um, uh, sex workers who marry, you know, their Johns. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Celine Padreñas Shamizu. She's professor and director of the School of Cinema at San Francisco, San Francisco State University. Her work does focus on race and sexuality and popular culture. She is the author of such books as The Hypersexuality of Race, and last year she released her book The Proximity of Other Skins. Do, do you do you find a shift in the portrayal in, in popular culture and cinema and movies and theater, maybe books uh, of Asian women that corresponds with the Korean and Vietnam, uh, Vietnam wars? Well, it, what's interesting is that in the time of the Korean war, um, there was a rise in the 
representation of war brides in pornography. And what's so interesting about it is that prior to the Korean War, really, and prior to World War II, the representation of Asian women in pornography was composed of white women in yellow face. So they were performing Asian womanhood and they did it through, you know, accoutrements, you know, strangely, of course, you know, nonsensically chopsticks in the hair, you know, fans, um, shoji screens, you know, different kinds of orientalia that made visible what was inherently not visible, which is, you know, um, sexual racialization. It had to be asserted through these decorations, and it also had to be asserted through intertidal text. Because what was famous about the earliest pornography, which is called, you know, stag pornography, it's unlike contemporary pornography, which really focuses on, you know, the money shot and male ejaculate. At the time, it was satisfying in itself to see filmic representations of genitalia. But What happened there, because they were not Asian women biologically, they were white women pretending to be Asian women, they would interrupt the genital shot with intertidal text that would say, look, it's the slanted vagina. Um, They they didn't necessarily say that. I'm trying to remember the exact words that they used in the intertidal text. It's in the book. (laughs) And so they would describe what was, you know, genital difference that you couldn't see in order to eroticize the experience and say, this is something, you know, really different. But um, after, you know, World War II and the Korean War, there was this upsurge of Asian women you would see in pornography, you know, for the first time. And unlike, you know, seeing, you know, um, Orientalia instruments inserted into the genital shot, instead what you would see is, you know, an Asian woman normalized into domesticity to make an argument about their presence suddenly as, you know, war brides, Um, you know, women that military, U.S. military men, you know, were bringing home. And so it's interesting what pornography shows us, you know, about fantasy in relation to history. Because what was interesting in the earlier stag films is that you know, what was going on at the time was this fear of Asian immigration. You know, Asians were barred from coming into this country. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, Filipinos like me, you know, um, you know, were able to come back and forth, you know, until the Tidings McDuffie Act where, you know, their classification changed and they could no longer travel, you know, back and forth. So there was this, you know, fear about Asians coming in as a kind of threat to national demographics and the the American family and making sure that Filipino men, Chinese men, Japanese men weren't marrying, you know, white women and creating these mixed race families. So Asian women, you know, couldn't come in. So, you know, it's interesting that they were really considered a threat, but in the pornography in stag pornography, they were really considered a kind of racial sexual treat. You know, so it's interesting. Historically, they were a threat in pornography. They were a treat. But then when Asian women started showing up in pornography, there was an argument being made that they were legible, intelligible as wives. So instead of the insertion of Orientalia into the genital shot, suddenly there's like a diamond ring in a hand in the genital shot you know, to show that they're married and they're having, you know, sex within marital relations. And it was a a normalization of miscegenation, which was, you know, considered illegal at the time, you know, in many states. And so um, that's really interesting, you know, how, you know, pornography really shows a kind of making sense of changing relationships, changing, you know, demographics and a changing status of Asian women, because, you know, prior to the lifting of the Chinese Exclusion Act, there was the implementation of the 1945 War Brides Act, which then, you know, exceeded the quotas of who can come in and made an exception for Asian women who were 
the brides of military, you know, U.S. men. So this included not only uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, but also, you know, um, Filipino women and, uh, you know, South Asian um, women. My understanding is that in researching sex, sex, sexuality and race, you, you spent a good amount of time at the Kinsian uh, Institute, uh, yes. especially a place where you were in, uh, researching how porn um, uses race. And it's it's interesting. I, one, isn't there a shift right around in the 90s specifically of what happens to Asian women in this betrayal? And then maybe if we just, I'll just put this up, up front. Uh, uh, two, um, it, it seems as though porn, which is ubiquitous, everyone can access it now, which is kind of interesting to think about. So hence, you know, promoting more, you know, stereotypes about people. But the other part is porn uses racial terms in a way that it would otherwise never be acceptable in, in society. So Mitch, you're right. You know, um, I spent a lot of time at the Kinsey Institute watching about 200 plus um, films um, that really started from stag films in the 1920s, which were these illegally made, you know, short films, you know, donated anonymously to the Kinsey Institute, you know, sometimes, um, you know, they would be dropped off, you know, at the steps and the librarians would come and just find boxes of these materials. Um, the police would also help and say, we found, you know, we found these materials and it became, you know, a place to study them. And what was amazing about Alfred Kinsey was that he really came up with a method of reading um, sex acts and films without judgment and with um, detailed description. And it included taking account of people who appeared on screen, you know, uh, from a different race. And unlike, you know, um, black and white, you know, African-American, you know, pornography, you don't, you can't quite tell skin color difference in African-American stag pornography. There was such an emphasis on skin color difference, you know, that the here is visible evidence proof that interracial sex is happening, but with Asian and Asian American representations, because they definitely had films that came from Asia as well. Um, you couldn't quite tell the skin color um, difference when it was interracial sex. And so in interracial sex, they established that racial difference through, through props and through intertitle text to narrate a sexual difference that you visibly, you know, um, couldn't see. And then from there, I, I looked at, you know, films from the 50s and the 60s that really directly related to the war, to the wars. And then after that, there was a rise in the golden age of pornography where the films were becoming um, just so much more cinematic and dramatic and with high production values. And there was a rise of Asian American um, porn stars. And, you know, throughout um, the work that I did, you know, in looking at um, stag films, which really established the presence of white women in yellow face. And I was really asking questions about what is the sexual fantasy life of the nation during a time of um, yellow peril and trying to really identify what was the particular role of Asian women, you know, in national fantasies that really racialized their sexual um, attributes. And then what happened, you know, later on, uh, later on, you know, towards the, so yeah, in, in the 40s and the 50s, it was really this establishment of, you know, women who you met and experienced through the war and somehow domesticated into wives. But then after that, you know, in the 70s on, there was the rise of the Asian American porn star, you know, Linda Wong, my Lynn, you know, Christara Barrington, and then the people we recognize more recently, you know, Asia Carrera, who entered the mainstream and, you know, did cameos in Hollywood films, and then the controversial figure, Annabelle Chong from the 90s. She was a, you know, women's studies, feminist studies major at USC, and she was really the, the first to do this genre of pornography called um, the world's you know, biggest gangbang. And she had, you know, um, sex with 
almost 300 men. Um, and it really extended this notion that, you know, Asian American women can represent, you know, the most perverse kind of uh, sexuality. Did she have politics at all as part of this? Did, did she see it as a political thing? I mean, as you're saying, she was someone who was well-versed uh, in, in feminism. Yeah, I mean, I, I, do, I do believe that Annabelle Chong was very explicit about saying, I am conscious throughout this process. I am not in any way drugged, you know, or unawake. I am very alert to the project of what I'm doing, which is to really shift our understanding of, you know, um, sexual prowess that seems to be tolerated and celebrated in men, but is condemned and vilified in women. So she really wanted to assert a kind of agency that was monstrous and feminist both in order to capture this kind of harsh commingling of racialization and sexualization that was attributed to Asian American women and representation and say, I'm going to confront this. It's, it's a very, um, it's a very, uh, you know, uh, complicated uh, story, but what was really, I think, striking about her work is, you know, the way in which she wouldn't let go, you know, of asserting this as, as an experience that she was authoring. And um, I think, you know, it, it, it's very affecting to watch because I think when you're watching pornography, it's very hard to distinguish between what pleasure and pain looks like when you're doing a close up on the face, you know? And this is something, you know, that was really very prominent in the language, you know, of that film. I would be remiss to say that there was a lot of, you know, problematic um, events around it in terms of, you know, how the people who were making the film could be exploiting her, regardless of the agenda that she was forwarding for herself. But in some ways, there was a kind of position of equanimity that she was asserting. Like, she doesn't really say, you may be exploiting me, but you don't get to define the experience for me. You know, I'm doing this for my own particular, you know, um, reasons of, you know, empowerment and undoing the trauma of sexual experience that I've endured in my life as an Asian American woman, you know, she would say. And... Um, to try to create a different, you know, narrative of triumph and victory that, you know, others may disagree with, but these are the terms that she um, used to organize her experience. I wanted to talk to you more about Anna Mae Wong. Anna Mae Wong is a big movie star in the early 20th century, uh, one of the first, if not the first big Asian female uh, movie star who had to play many of these portrayals that we talked about earlier that, that you had to, to meet in these films. Did she ever talk about those things? Do we have a, an account of what that was like for her? Anna Mae Wong, you know, was a hugely talented, you know, actor. If you were just to Google her name, you know, you could see the wide range of emotion, you know, that she was really able to express really just on her face, as well as, you know, the way that she had to, you know, scurry around in an animalistic way in some of her most famous films, like, you know, the classic film Thief of Baghdad. I think it would be an injustice to simply classify her roles as either Dragon Lady or Lotus Blossom, because that is that is what they what they look like. You know, Toll of the Sea is the classic Lotus Blossom role, ser servile, suicidal, forever suffering, sac self-sacrificing. And then, you know, the Dragon Lady is really in her, one of her first major roles, Thief of Baghdad, you know, where she is not only deceptive, <clears throat> but someone who really takes over the narrative and pulls it in a different way uh, in order to serve herself, save herself, um, uh, you know, be loyal to... Um, you know, who the, the men in the community who were representing Asians, you know, within within the film, because precisely of what you say, Mitch, which is she really deployed fan culture and popular media in order to comment and critique her roles. You know, she was very adamant about saying, why is it 
that there is this insistence and a commitment to render Asian American, a- Asian culture as primitive when, you know, she says this is a thousand year old culture of, of dignity and wealth. So why are we simplified? You know, uh, why are we rendered in this animalistic, you know, primitive way? And um, she offered through these interviews, um, it, not just a critique, you know, but a vehement assertion that this was truly unfair, you know, for her, not only in terms of the limited, you know, roles that she had to play, but the way the media constructed her as almost outside time, outside society. You know, she never rode a bicycle, you know, she had, you know, such long nails that she couldn't function in everyday life. And she would explicitly quote them and say, why would you say that about me? You know, I am an everyday American, you know, woman. And so to me, it would be unfair to simplify her roles as one to which she did not contribute. So we have to be careful in saying these are merely stereotypes when actually the terrain of Hollywood has always been one composed of Asian American women actors like Anna Mae Wong, who fought for a different world, who fought for a different reality, and they wanted to use their own words and to demand for us as viewers in the future, as well as viewers of her time to say, this is an imposition and an infliction, which I am fighting at the front lines. So it is our responsibility as spectators to dig up her own words, you know, that describe her fight on our behalf. Well, was she saying these things after she stopped making movies? Did she ever stop making movies? Was this something she could have said while she was making movies? She absolutely said them while she was making movies, you know, which is stunning, right? So she was talking like this in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and she she died... um, you know, right before she was supposed to be in that all Asian cast film, um, Flower Drum Song. So she never got to to be in it. But that's what's so stunning about it. And that's why we must hear hers, because even at a time when she was being condemned by the Chinese community for portraying these roles that supposedly damaged the community, she acknowledged it by saying, should I be, you know, deprived in a sense, you know, of this amazing thing of which I have talent and opportunity and I'm going to fight it and I'm going to contribute to a different kind of representation. And so she did, you know, um, try to get roles that she was not ultimately, you know, given the opportunity to perform. And she also had to travel, you know, to Europe in order to get opportunities, much like her contemporary Asian American, you know, movie star, the male version, Sashua Hayakawa. And so she even chronicled, you know, the need to do that as an experience of discrimination in the industry, in the Hollywood industry at the time. So she was adamant and fearless, bold, courageous, and brave, you know, and it's very different from the way other Asian American Hollywood femme fatales, you know, have had to speak. So hands down, bow down, you know, to the power of Anna Mae Wong, who really used, you know, fan culture at the time to reach out to people to say, don't experience movies as this simplification, take my own words and let that show you what I tried to do on screen. So before you condemn it, really look at it as a document of my struggle. Is this something that we would find with other Asian actors, actresses afterwards and forever after? Yeah. It's so interesting that, you know, we've really seen, you know, Asian American femme fatales in Hollywood, you know, 1920s or so, Anna Mae Wong, the 1960s saw the rise of Nancy Kwan, who was a British Chinese actress of such humongous talent, you know, um, so you can Google, you know, classic scenes from the world of Susie Wong, where she's just so sassy and wearing her, you know, her matching, you know, dresses and bags and shoes and really portrayed, you know, the sex worker with a particular kind of innocence that I think really contributed a lot to, to the popularity, you know, um, she had a lot of power within um, the film in terms of you know, asserting herself as a different option to white women. But then at the same time, she definitely had to say lines like, I will follow you until you tell me go away. Um, 
so it's tricky, but she herself really resented, you know, the assertion that what she was doing was really bringing down Asian women, that what she was doing in portraying a prostitute was representing Asian women only as prostitutes. And she wanted to say that there's a particular kind of achievement that my visibility um, is able to secure for us, you know, through my performances, my my celebrated, you know, dance and song. And, and, and there truly is something amazing. If, if you'd like to look up, I enjoy being a girl. It's, it's a performance really worth uh, reading um, in terms of, you know, um, female power, um, you know, what to do with, you know, the assertion that you are hypersexualized and to somehow negotiate that in your performance. So it, it's powerful. I mean, it's mesmerizing. It's fascinating. She is really taking claim of the stage as someone worth representation, you know? Um, but she definitely countered, you know, the assertions by Asian American film critics, you know, who said this is an objectified role, you know, and she wanted to prioritize instead, you know, what she was able to do for Asian American visibility. And then, you know, 40 years, 30, 40 years or so later, you know, the, the actress, you know, Lucy Liu, you know, burst into this, in the, to the television screen playing Ling Wu and Ali McBeal. And, you know, she was proud, you know, to create that role. It was once again, like this, this, this role of power. She would say the word sex just by the, by saying the word, you know, it would affect everybody in the room, like some kind of natural, you know, storm happened, you know? So she herself would say, you know, in her interviews that, she was proud of this role, but at the same time, she would do like a, a double move and say, but remember, these roles I try to take in order to open other doors, to create opportunities, to prove, to prove you know, um, box office promise so that I can have more control in the future. And she definitely, you know, um, tried to make films herself, you know, as a producer, et cetera, and, um, you know, um, wanted to get away from only, you know, racially de overdetermined roles. But she would definitely say things like, I have to take on roles because I have bills to pay. But she would also, so there, was, there, was, there was a great interview that she did with Playboy that also, you know, not only celebrated her own achievements as a star, but also offered a critique of what Asian American were undergoing in representation. So it makes you realize how Anna Mae Wong, precisely because she was alone, you know, not very many Asian American women were actors at the time, really full force went for it in terms of offering a critique. And, you know, Nancy Kwan and Lucy Liu are situated within different historical moments, you know, the emergence of Asian American cinematic critique, Asian American nonprofit organizations that really bolster, strengthen, make possible Asian American filmmaking were happening at the same time that Nancy Kwan was emerging as an actor. And, you know, Lucy Liu was also happening at a time when other actors were coming up and, you know, doing different kinds of critiques like Margaret Cho and Sandra Oh. So, I mean, I'm particularly excited now about the different Asian American women centered productions that we have seen released just in the past year. I'm talking about To All the Boys I've Loved Before, a very popular young teen, you know, uh, almost like a rom-com series on Netflix. Never have I ever, you know, really based on growing up of a really well-known uh, South Asian American actress, Mindy Kaling, the film, um, the half of it by Alice Wu, who made the film Saving Face almost 20 years ago to show, you know, queer representations of falling in love as a teen. And of course, my favorite, one of my favorite films that just came out in the past year, the first Philippine ex-American film to be released by a major Hollywood studio, Diana Paragas's Yellow Rose, which is about an undocumented Philippine ex-American teenager. And you can see in these recent productions that, that these films are squarely within the vast and dazzling expanse between the Dragon Lady and the Lotus Blossom. And you can really see these young Asian American women confronting sexuality in their own terms, defining sexuality in their own terms. So there's a lot of promising work that's happening in, in Hollywood right now regarding the sexual representation of Asian American women that's more empowering, that's, that's, that centers themselves.
and not this imposition of being for others that we've faced for the past hundred or so years. Celine Padreñas Shemizu has been our guest. She is professor and director of the School of Cinema at San Francisco State University. Her work does focus on race and sexuality and popular culture. In 2007, she published her book, The Hypersexuality of Race. And last year, she released her book, The Proximity of Other Skins. Celine Padreñas Shemizu, I found that very important and really felt like we could have gone another hour just sort of scratched at these issues. I, I hope we could have you uh, on again to talk about this, but I'm, I'm very thankful to you uh, for spending this time with us today. I really appreciate the opportunity. This is a really um, very sad and enraging time for the Asian American community, and I really appreciate the light that you have helped to focus on this history that Asian American women have had to face of an imposition of hypersexual identity into our lives that we fight. Well, we are, we are grateful for, to you. Time. Yeah. Well, we are grateful to you for, for doing this. So thank you.